Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And we're on episode 165, which is amazing. And the title of this podcast episode is The Powers in the Patient, an Important Reminder. I love that title, Bob. No idea what we're going to talk about, but I love it. What do you like about it? I just like the fact that the power is in the patient and that we're not in control of the healing or whatever takes place uh-huh. in there. We can't make the client do anything. That's yeah, how I interpret it. In a journey less travelled, I think it's by somebody, Scott, who was talking about uh, somewhere in it, they talk about the therapist is, is like a witness on the journey of life. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That, yeah. I was just saying to you off air whether I was light enough. Mm. Um, on a different computer altogether. Yeah. Uh, seems very dull compared to my other computer, but my other computer was very big. And I'm on this sort of mobile computer. But anyway, I'll have to get used to um, seeing you in a smaller picture frame. But getting back to the title, yes. Yeah, so the title comes from a book, actually. And this book was written by two well-known, if not famous, probably say famous because they created a whole movement within TA. Um, and these people were called Bob and Mary Goulding. And they were famous really for uh, creating what they called the redecision model of psychotherapy from the TA perspective. Yeah. And what happened was when Eric Byrne, who was the originator of transaction analysis psychotherapy, died on Carmel Beach of a double heart attack in 1970. Um, he had a heart attack and then he went into hospital and then he had another heart attack. Um, the TA movement, the IT International Transaction Analysis Association, um, besides going into mourning, uh, split into three camps, if you like. You had the classical transaction analyst who followed Eric Burns' uh, leanings um, and style that TA is very much about strengthening the adult ego state. Then you had the, what was called the Schiffian School, which was much more about reparenting and the parenting, the parenting needs to be parented. And then you had the Gouldings who created redecision psychotherapy from a transactional perspective. So you had three splits. And the Gouldings, who were uh, very well known in, um, I'm not sure if it was California, where they had their ranch, but anyway. Um, and they were well known for for in the social world and also social work world, I mean, and also in the world of psychiatry. But they were TA therapists and they brought a lot of gestalt ideas into transaction analysis. But getting back to the book, they wrote a book. After their book on redecision psychotherapy, they wrote, wrote a book called The Powers in the Patient. This is where I got the title from. I also like this title i like the book and i like the philosophical implications that underpin the title of that book and in I other words i would like that book as well bob <laughs> yeah, it came out in 1973 i think yeah probably getting on ebay or amazon very very cheaply <clears throat> but the philosophical ph- philosophical implications are that um there's an emphasis on personal responsibility in a way, of the client. In other words, what I mean by that is that um, instead of sort of passing the power, if you talk about power dynamics to the therapist in the transferential place, what they're talking about is that the client, um, in America, they call clients patients. That's why it's, well, we could say powers in the client for the UK audience. Um, the if we 
move away from a sort of infantilized process, which I think quite a lot of therapists might come from. We're talking about the the client has always got the ability to change. Yeah. It's them that really make the changes. It's the therapist might have, um, I know, might, might sort of use permission transactions and give permissions for the clients to make new decisions or uh, Eric, Eric Byrne, you see, talked about the power of the therapist in the process of redishes and psychotherapy, whereas the Gouldens talk about the power is always in the client, really, uh, in terms of making redecisions about their own uh, life and script. So there's a fundamental difference between Byrne and Gouldens here, but the Gouldens specifically believed that they are more witnesses. Yeah. And they are very powerful part if you like in the client's journey but really at the end of the day it's the client that makes the choices not the therapist in terms of redeciding their own lives like me and taking their own power to make changes with regard to their own destiny it's the client that does that not the client in response to the therapist's powerful processes or something yeah I like the idea of that. <clears throat> yeah, and the book is very much um, about that, really, um, about the clients making the new decisions, and the therapist might set the stage or, you know, help them do that through role play or whatever it is. But let us not forget that the power has always been with the client, even if they don't feel they have the power. Yeah, because if client or the patient, whatever, makes the decision to change, then they have they've taken the power to do that. If we we can't tell them to change, they might change because a therapist recommends it. But then, do they truly believe that change? If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that that makes great sense, and. It's probably where I come from. I mean, the counter arguments to this or the counter debates is very much linked in the world of transference. In other words, especially psychoanalysts might believe this, and I think Byrne also believed it, that within the transference, the client passes over the power to the idealised psychotherapist yeah and then the psychotherapist um has such a powerful part to play burn and use the phrase dragging the clients up by their bootstraps <laughs> to 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 actually make the redecisions so if we're believing in transference and we follow that transferential path then i can understand the discourse. See, the Gouldings talked about, they didn't really talk about transference, really. They talked about in awareness and out of awareness rather than in transference. Yeah. So somebody <clears throat> were in their therapy groups started talking about, I don't know, talking about, well, you remind me of your dad or something. Bob Goulding would shout, I'm not your dad at all. I am a th I am a therapist doing my work here, or, or whatever he would say. Yeah, and he 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 didn't believe in this whole projection of transference. Now I'm sure he knew a lot about transference and could understand the discourse about it, but he wanted to really put over that the client had the power, not him. Yeah, that he wasn't their dad. See, again, Bob, I, I can relate to that. I quite like that. And I think for for people that are listening that aren't transactional analysis, it's all about, you know, we make these decisions early in life that then we then live our adult life by. So it stands to reason if we made the decision in the first place, then we need to make the re-decision or a new decision So, yeah, having the power to do that and to have the awareness and to understand where it all began 
to me is is good therapy. Mm. So the Gouldings in this whole frame of redecision psychotherapy um, would say that you need to make the redecision, say the redecision to be able to express feelings or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, when you actually at the time when you actually decided the opposite, just like you're saying. So you need to go back. And if you have sort of commands in your head about you're not important. Yeah. You do role play to talk to the person who gave you that and message in the first place and make a redecision. But you need to go back to the early scene where you first decided that. You're with me, my say you might absolutely, yeah. Because if you can connect back with that time, that place, and you know, visualize it and feel the emotions that you would be feeling and all those sort of things, really bring it to life, then to make a new decision, I would imagine, would be really powerful for the client. Yeah, so the Goulding's um suggested the method of regression through visualization usually to go back to the early scene. Yeah. Where they made their first decision that I'm not important, for example, or whatever it is. And then through role play to um, make a new decision that they are important and then integrate it in their life today through their adult ego state. Yeah. That's, that's quite heavy stuff, that. One for the client to actually remember a time where they made that decision that's mm -hmm. that's going to take some doing i would imagine <laughs> yeah so what you would do is you're quite right by the way because i've done a lot of this work yeah this style is often the clients don't remember early scenes however if you ask them to go back to a recent time where they uh acted out on that message where yeah. they were important, say in the last four or five years or something. Yes, yeah. They are then they then usually can go back to that. Yeah. From that position, in my experience, is often like like dominoes. So when you go back to that experience and they start replaying that and talking to the person through role play again, they then then usually other memories become accessible to them. That makes sense, yeah. And they go back to an earlier scene, which that memory's become accessible because they've started it. Yeah. Off the uh, latest one. And then that takes them to another place. So it's like onion, you know, go, go through layers of onions. Yeah, because even this morning, with a, I had a new client start this <clears> morning, and even with them, you know, one of the things I always ask is, you know, what's your earliest memory? What's what's the earliest thing? You know, when I'm trying to get to know them and doing a bit of timeline stuff. And it's usually around, you know, the first day at school. That can be a trigger for a lot of people. Can you remember your first day at school, mm -hmm. which is around, you know, five years old? Prior mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. our memories are very difficult to correct connect to. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely correct. Um, so these memories become more accessible through what I call the domino approach. Yeah. And you're going down through the layers of memories, like layers of an onion. So you get to the earliest time possible for the, for the client to take the power and make a new decision and then integrate it in their adult. Yeah. Now, Eric Byrne thought redecisions need to be taken from the adult ego state in the present time uh, and wouldn't use regressive techniques to go backwards. So there's the difference in the methodology. Yeah. How do you know if you're doing it in the present time? Well, how do you know anyway that the well, client uh, isn't just doing it to please the therapist? If the... well, There's two different questions there. <laughs> <laughs> One is a really big question. In a, a massive question. I'm, I don't know if I've got a podcast on it or not. Are, you know, which is, are we really either always rebelling or pleasing the therapist? I mean, that's a debate and a podcast in itself. Yeah. So let's not go off that ground because we'll be here for a very long time. 
uh, so the, the first but that was your second question how the first one I think was did you say something how do you do it yeah yeah well in the Bernian way of thinking they will say okay so sounds like what you're talking about is the feeling not important who, who don't you feel important with oh I just don't feel important in life oh okay who gave you that message then oh well I think it's always been said verbally or non-verbally by my dad when I go around he never really speaks to me I know that he thinks that I'm not important okay put your dad on the chair and we'll role play that and tell him tell him how it feels like when you say that and then perhaps we can make a new do a new decision from that place right. so that would be the adults yeah that would be present time it wouldn't be regressive what are your thoughts on that because for me I think if if we're going back and we're connecting I see that as connecting with our child ego state and that to me is where all the emotion and everything is held and for me that would make more sense to do the redecision work. Well, I think if you stay in the present, you're most likely to redecide from cognition rather than emotion. Yeah. Which and is which is best said. to do it with cognition or emotion? I was too fast. I think it's much more powerful in my experience when a person can regress and go back as far as they can to early memories because you need to make the new redecision. I think, as as near emotionally or cognitively or emotionally, really, to when the early decision was made. Yeah. So I think it's much more powerful and much more effective if you use regressive techniques to get back to when they first made those defensive decisions. So yeah. So I I I I've always. Um, taken people back aggressively to a younger age. If I stayed in the present, it often becomes a cognitive addition, which I don't think is as powerful. No. And doesn't, and doesn't stick as long. Yeah. And, and somehow, I think for me, the clients find it easier to stay in the cognition and stay in the thinking part rather than going to that emotional early stage. I think yeah, they yeah. feel more vulnerable yeah, in that yeah, place. Yeah. 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 Usually people use their cognition as a defense yeah. against feeling their vulnerability and expressing emotions. And quite a lot of times you need to go th through their cognition or get alongside their cognition to get to the vulnerable part. Now, if you do do that, by definition, you probably going to use some aggressive techniques yeah if you go and do cbt with the nhs or not which is very different from what we're talking about here it's much more of a cognitive decision yes yeah but i think it's far more powerful to go back to where you made the decisions in the first place which is usually called inner child work by the way and make re decisions from that place and then integrate it in your adult present time yeah i think that's that's really what redecision psychotherapy is i think the principle that the power is in the client is a very important one um, because if you drift away from that then um you're in a different ballpark with regards to therapy and the power dynamics become very different if you actually believe that you're really sort of um, proportionally, you know, you're the person that really, uh, like Eric Burns said, drags them up by the uh, boot laces um, and, the, and they then make the decisions. You don't really know whether they're making those decisions out of fear yeah. or, or adaptation. I think that's what I would be thinking. Yeah, we, I don't know. I was wanted to say we can force them to make these decisions, but if they're not going to stick around, they're no. not going to stick no. to it. It's just, no. yeah, absolutely. You need, them, you, need the, you need them to have the autonomy to be able to make those decisions and have the access to self-agency to make those decisions. Otherwise, I don't believe they'll stick. 
No. Yeah. I agree 100%. I mean, I think clients who leave um, in what I call still the transferential process uh, and think they are better, maybe better to a certain degree, but if you're talking about decisions that stick, that's another story because they might really just leave uh, with you in their heads instead of their dads in or mothers in their heads and um, that might be marginally better but if you're talking about real autonomy then I think it's a different story yeah I agree when yeah when I've had some clients even you know years after I've seen them say things like you know whenever I'm worried about something I always say what would Jackie say so I suppose they do carry us with them. But I wouldn't like to think that any of my clients thought that I had the power over them in that respect. I'm yeah, along so, in the journey with them, yeah, but they have the power. So Eric Erickson, a very well-known hypnotherapist and psychotherapist, wrote a book, not Eric Erickson, sorry, Milton Erickson, wrote a book, I think it was talked, now, somebody told me it wasn't this title, but I thought it was. Take my words with you. It's a version of that anyway. And it's on the principle that the clients will do exactly what you have just said, and which is refer to what Jackie would say. Um, I like to think, though, and I'm not sure I, in the book, because it's a long time since I've read it, that that really ought to be just one stage and that they are able to integrate your voice to a place where their own autonomy and self-agency is uh, more energetic. Yeah. I say that about you a lot of the time, Bob. Some of your yeah. phrases and sayings, do you know yeah. what I mean? I know exactly where they come from, and I relate them back to you. Mm. That's the difference, though. You know where it's come from. Relate right back to me, and it's from an adult state. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think that's completely different. And I think it's fine to have that. And it's also fine to have mentors. But if it gets to a place where most of uh, your functioning is in response to uh, these voices from the mentors, then yeah, it, that again is a different ballpark. Yeah. Or maybe not even being able to function without knowing, you know, I, yeah, I, I've had clients in the past that, have contacted me outside of the therapy room asking my opinions on whether they should do certain things and one I never answered them but two we would talk about it in the sessions because <coughs> I didn't want that responsibility you know I will support you in whatever decision you make whether it's the right one or the wrong one but you need to make the decision yeah that's right that's this that's right and uh that's the path I would take yeah so I like the, the fact that you mentioned before. about in awareness and out of awareness as well. I think that's important. You see, I think that's very different from in transference and out of transference. I think an in and out of awareness. I like that phrase better. Yeah. Me too. So it's much more, I think, a much more flexible term than um and transference in a way because once you st once you get into the world of transference then um the power dynamics sh not only change but i think that therapists can often get stuck in the transference themselves and then the client can get more well, might get infantilized in the process so i like the terms in, in awareness and out awareness yeah well I do like that because I think a lot of the decisions <laughs> that we make now are out of our awareness and it's habitual and everything. And just to bring that to the client's attention and get them back in their awareness, you know, that in itself is powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Yeah. It's a good book, by the way, to read. I think it's 1973. It's by the Gouldings, Bob Goulding and Mary Goulding. 
I will uh, have a look at that. They were the originator of Reedus's and Psychotherapy in the TA world. Um, I'm sure you get the book really cheap. I've got it in my, I was looking for it earlier on, but I couldn't find it, but I've got it. I've got all their books because I like, I like the um, emphasis on personal responsibility. I quite I like, like the title of redecision therapy as well because it gives you hope. Do you know what I mean? That you can redecide how it's mm. going to be from here moving forward, and I like that. Yeah, mm. and like so you say, all... it gives the client their, their own autonomy as well. That that it's it's down to them. Mm. They were very popular therapists. Um, eventually, I think Bob Goulding died of emphysemia um, about ninety-two. I'm not sure. I think. Mary Goulding sort of lived 10 years after or so after that. But yeah. he was quite young when he died, but I can't remember his age. But he did smoke a lot and died of emphysema eventually. And But they were very famous in their day, especially for the redecision model. And it's still going strong today. Yeah, and I think the book was a bestseller then as well, Power and the Patient. Yeah. I'm, I shall Google that and have a look, Bob. And like you say, it'll be around somewhere, a second-hand copy of it. Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. So we both agree that the power is in the patient. I've never doubted it. Yeah. And in fact, if I ever drift away from that belief system, I think it's my ego taking over. So I try and rein my ego in. And I think that phrase is very grounding. Yeah. Mm. So, on to next week, Bob. And what's the title for next week? Empathy is the oxygen of successful therapy. Well, who would ever doubt that? But anyway, I look forward to talk about it. It's a good topic for the next one. Yeah. Until next time, Bob. Yeah, see you then. Take care. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.